So in any clinical situation, our priorities are airway, breathing and circulation. So whenever we've got a patient we're not sure about, if there's a low level of consciousness and the patient's not responding to us properly, we have to check their airway and their breathing. And sometimes you can just put your hand over the patient's mouth like that and you can feel the air going in and out as it uh, moves onto your hand. But if you're not sure, you need to look, listen and feel. So what we can do here is we can put our ear down next to the patient's nose. And then if the patient's breathing, we can hear the air and we can feel it on our ear. And we can also look as well as we look for the movement of the patient's chest and abdomen. So we can look, listen and feel for the patient's airway. Now, if we don't have an airway, if we don't have a flow of air, then the first thing we need to do is to open the airway. And in this situation, I'm going to assume the patient does not have a cervical spinal injury because this is a medical patient. If the patient has a C-spine injury, then we have to prioritise that with airway. Because if you look at the trauma guidelines, it's A stands for airway with C-spine control. But we're assuming this is a medical patient, and if it's a medical patient, we can open the airway. Now what I'd like you to do for me, please, if you put your chin down on your chest like that, can you do that? Put your chin down on your chest and take a breath in. And I think you'll find you can, in fact, take a breath in, in that position. But the reason for that is that you don't realise you're doing it, but subconsciously you are pulling your tongue forward to allow you to do that. And this model demonstrates this for us quite nicely. So when your head is down in that position, and you're conscious, you're automatically pulling your tongue forward. Now what we have on this model, it's an old one, but it's a very good one. We have the nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oropharynx. This large red bit, of course, is the tongue. This is the esophagus, and this is the trachea. And when you're conscious, you're automatically moving your tongue forward like that, so the air can go through the oral cavity, through the nasal cavity, and down into the anterior trachea. So that's good. But the trouble is, if you're unconscious, especially if you're lying flat, then what happens is your tongue falls back like that. And I think you can see now, the air can't get through the oral cavity, it can't get through the nasal cavity, well it can, but it can't get past the oropharynx into the trachea. So an unconscious patient can asphyxiate and die simply because their tongue is falling back the way. It is falling back. And to remedy that situation, providing we're happy the patient does not have a cervical spine injury, is to simply open the patient's airway. And we do this by pulling the head back like that. That's called opening the airway. And now you can see that we've tilted the patient's head back. That head tilt has pulled the tongue forward. And now the oropharynx is patent and this patient can now breathe. Provide, well, the, as long as the airway is open, as long as they're breathing. So that's opening the airway. So let's try and relate that to this model here. So let's open the airway. So the patient is unconscious, so we're going to open the airway, and you can see that's actually opening the patient's mouth a little bit. And again, we're going to look, listen, and feel. Now, if we have breath sounds and we can feel the breath at that stage, that means that we've opened the airway, but the patient is breathing. And if we've got good breath sounds, that will mean they also have a circulation as well. So at that point, we could simply put the patient into the recovery position. Keep the airway open and summon help. But if we've opened the airway, but there's still no respiratory effort, then that means the patient is not breathing for some reason. This could be a cardiac arrest situation or a respiratory arrest situation. The patient is not breathing. Now normally when you breathe, as you probably know, <coughs> the ribs go up and out and the diaphragm goes down and both of those things are going to increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. As you increase the volume of the thoracic cavity, that's going to reduce the pressure and the air is going to be sucked in. 
that this patient is not making any ventilatory effort. So he can't negatively pressure ventilate. So we have to positively pressure ventilate. That means we actually have to blow air into his lungs. And we can do that as long as the airway is open. We can blow air into here and that will go down into the trachea. And to do that, in an adult patient, we're going to open the airway and we're going to form a seal over the nose because we don't want material from the nose blowing on our face and we don't want the air blowing out of the nose because if it's blowing out of the nose it's not going into the patient's lungs. And what I need to do in this situation is pinch the patient's nose and I need to use my lips to form a seal around this patient's lips and it's got to be an airtight seal. And if I do that, hopefully what we'll see is that these lungs inflate as a result of my positive pressure ventilation. So let's give that a go. And I'll look away. And you can see I'm now inflating this patient's lungs. Now, atmospheric air contains about 21% oxygen, 20.84. My exhaled air contains about 16% oxygen and that is enough to keep this patient alive, make no mistake. So I can ventilate him using just simple mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. But in hospital situations I might use airway adjuncts. And the most common sort of airway adjunct I might use is one of these oropharyngeal airways. And if I demonstrate on this, you can see how these work. So they're going to go in the patient's mouth like this. And they're oropharyngeal. So they're going to take air through the mouth down into the patient's pharynx. Now it's important to know that the patient could still vomit with one of these airways. The airway is not protected. So it's still perfectly possible for vomit to come up the esophagus and be inhaled into the trachea. The airway is not protected, we have to bear that in mind. But we've got an oropharyngeal airway, it's keeping the tongue out of the way, so that's going to let air in to the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. So that's good. So how do we fit one of these in practice? Well, we open the patient's mouth and these actually go in Sorry, I'll tell you how to size it first. We size these by going from the edge of the patient's ear to the corner of their mouth. So we see that one's a bit big for this patient. Let's just try a slightly smaller one. Corner of the ear to the corner of the mouth. Yeah, I think that one just about fits. So we try and get the right size. Then we open the patient's mouth and that actually goes in upside down like that. And it goes straight back. Then when we start to feel some resistance, we twist that round and that fits as we saw on the model. So I'll just show you that again. So these are actually going in upside down and twisting round. And with a bit of practice, it's one simple movement. In upside down and twisting round. And we now have that airway in place. Then we can use other airway adjuncts to ventilate this patient. So for example, this is quite a nice little device that you might carry around with you in your, in your car, for example. We can open that up. It's already fitted with a filter. And we can put that on. Now what this is actually going to do is it's going to give us a seal around about the patient's mouth and nose. I'm then going to press that on using my fingers on top, finger and thumb on top and some fingers underneath. Keep the patient's airway open and let's see if I'm able to ventilate the patient's lungs when I blow into this. So we'll see if we get some good lung ventilation here. That's good. Now the first time, air was escaping around these edges here. But then when I got a better seal, I think you can now see I've got better lung inflation. So 
So we're inflating that patient's lungs with 16% oxygen. And that's fine, that's going to keep them happy, that's going to keep them alive. That will allow oxygenation of the brain and the vital organs, providing they have a circulatory system. But also in hospital, we often use this equipment. We have a mask and a bag. This is a reservoir bag. So oxygen can be blowing into here, filling up the reservoir bag. And again, we can ventilate the patient. So we want to keep the airway. That fits into there like that, so that can go in there. And we can ventilate the patient with this. Now, when oppressed with this, we should see that reservoir bag go down. Let's try that first of all, looking at the reservoir bag. So bear in mind, oxygen is being blown into here, filling up the reservoir bag. And when I ventilate, that's taking oxygen from the reservoir bag, increasing the concentration of oxygen. So what I've got here, looking at the patient's face, is I've got a good seal. I've opened the airway and I can ventilate the patient. And let's look at the patient's lungs and make sure I'm getting good ventilation. Yeah. So I'm ventilating the patient's lungs. And to do this in the clinical situation is remarkably satisfying. I've come across patients that are really completely cyanosed and blue. And you put in a simple oropharyngeal airway, you turn your oxygen up as high as it will go to 15%, and you ventilate the patient, and within four or five breaths, you just see the cyanosis abate and that lovely normal pink color returning as we ventilate the patient. Now, there are other, other adjuncts we can use. And I think we'll probably just look at one more basic one on this video. But for now, let's just concentrate on this nice ventilation we're getting. Very easy to do. If you've got small hands, you could do it against your hip like that. Or of course, if you've got an assistant, you could hold it on with two hands and get your assistant to ventilate the bag for you. Now, a new type of airway we're using now are these uh, eye gel airways. Just take that one out. Oh, taking these out. Very often, as clinicians, we don't take these out. We ask the patient to take it out. And if the patient's conscious enough to physically take that out, he's probably conscious enough to maintain his own airway. So if we let the patients take it out, that's a good gauge of their level of consciousness. Now I think the last one I'll show you is this new uh, eye gel airway. These are very cleverly designed. You can put a tube down there to suck out the patient's stomach if it's compressed, if it's um, blown up to decompress the stomach. And they're eye gel airways. And this is not ideal for it, but I'll just show you where they fit on this. So they would go through the patient's mouth and that tip would just sit in the patient's esophagus like that, or the tip of the esophagus. That means the air can go from the lumen of the tube down into the patient's trachea. The eye gel airways. And the great thing about these is they require a very low skill level to work effectively. So with these, all we do is open the patient's mouth and they just go straight back in like that. And then you feel slight resistance and then it's time to stop. And there we have an airway. Now again, the airway is not fully protected with these, but we have a, a relatively low skill airway to fit. We can then take this mask off the bag. We can connect up the bag directly to the eye gel airway. And we can ventilate this patient. Now in humans, this works very effectively. Unfortunately, this mannequin is not really designed for it. But I think you can see the lungs are moving a bit. But trust me, in humans, this works very, very well.
so we can maintain the airway. Again, the airway is not fully protected. There is the possibility of aspiration. So the next level of protection that we could use is endotracheal intubation. Now with endotracheal tubes, if I put that there, with endotracheal tubes we can blow up this cuff. So the cuff is now deflated and when I blow it up you can see the cuff is now blowing up. And as long as that's in the patient's trachea that will protect the airway in case the patient vomits but still have a lumen through there for the patient to breathe through. Now of course I can't tell you how to train you how to fit these on a video but I can show you the principle and what's happening here if we think about this this is going through the patient's mouth and it's going forward like that into their trachea so it's fitting in to the patient's trachea through the oral cavity like that and then when I blow this up once it's in place I blow that up and although this model is not designed for it I think you can see that that is going to blow up and protect the airway so once that's in the airway if the patient were to vomit that cuff will prevent aspiration of vomit so it's endotracheal because it's in the trachea Now to fit an endotracheal tube takes a bit of additional training but I'm going to show you the principle and it's not too hard, we'll reduce one of these laryngoscopes which gives us a light yeah we've got a light now these laryngoscopes are go, going to go into the patient's mouth and it's going to allow us to see the epiglottis and although I can't really teach you on this, I'll just show you briefly how it works. We're going to lift that out of the way, close one eye, put that into the trachea. Now you will have to get someone to train you how to do that, but uh, let's just see if it works. We'll blow the cuff up. Now that cuff is blown up, if this patient vomits, I'm much less concerned. I can just suck it out. So let's see if I can ventilate this patient effectively now. And if we look at the lungs, we now see we're getting totally effective ventilation. And we have the reassurance of knowing that our patient's airway is now fully protected. So it's only the endotracheal tube that provides what we call the gold standard of airway protection. So we could now <coughs> suck out any secretions from this patient's, top of this patient's airway. We can deflate to the endotracheal tube and we can extubate this patient. So try and get hold of a mannequin and have a go at that and to get someone to train you up on these more advanced airway skills. But certainly everyone needs to be able to open airways and use simple airway adjuncts because our priorities in all clinical situations are airway and breathing. Then we will go on to circulation. The only exception to attending to the airway first is if there's a catastrophic hemorrhage, in which case we would attend to that first. But in 99.99% of clinical situations you're going to come across, your priorities are going to be airway and breathing. <coughs>